<laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Challenger Jacku and welcome back to the second part of this No Ring Challenge series, where we take on Sonic Heroes to see where it's possible to beat the game without collecting any rings. But before we begin, if you love Sonic content or challenge videos in general, and you want to see more content like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash the subscribe button, like the video and hit that naughty bell. We're now on the road to 2k subscribers by the end of the year, and any help to hit that goal is truly appreciated. Now I'll quickly go over the rules of the challenge, just as a bit of a refresher since it's been a while. First of all, if you collect a ring at any point, it counts as a fail and we have to restart the stage. Next, the run will begin at Seaside Hill and is completed upon the defeat of the Egg Emperor. And finally, yes, this run will be glitchless as they weren't really needed during the routing. Now, without any further ado, let's jump straight in. Before we start, I just want to quickly give you a rundown of this strange trio. If you were as young as me when Heroes originally came out, you may believe that this was the debut of these seemingly new characters. However, that isn't the case. Team Chaotix originally got their start in a Knuckles spin-off developed for the 32X add-on, appropriately named, well, Knuckles Chaotix. And it suddenly becomes apparent why barely anybody knew about these characters prior to Heroes, doesn't it? Now I'm not going to give you my thoughts on that game as that isn't the point here. This is just to convey that these guys got their start way earlier than most of us kids thought at the time. In Sonic Heroes, there are a group of detectives struggling to pay their rent, and upon receiving a communication device in the mail, they set out on their next adventure at the behest of their mysterious client. A rather straightforward premise that they actually incorporate into the gameplay itself, believe it or not. Compared to the other stories, Chaotix are an outlier, in the sense that whilst they traverse through the same stages and level layouts as the other three, what they're actually doing within the stages themselves contrasts heavily. You still have some point A to B missions, however for the most part you'll be doing anything from collecting a certain amount of things within the stage, traversing the stage stealthily to avoid detection, and my least favourite of the bunch, killing every single enemy to proceed, no exceptions. If this sounds familiar, well it should, as this is the exact same premise that the next game Shadow the Hedgehog was built upon, so if anything Team Chaotic serve as a precursor to the foundation of that game, for better or for worse. To be honest, I wasn't quite sure how this change of pace would affect our chances overall. On a first glance, this slower pace would seem to suit us far better than having to potentially clear an entire 9 minute stage. If there was any challenges that forced us to collect a set amount of rings though, we'd be screwed. For our first objective, it's a simple matter of collecting the Hermit Crabs 10 in total to clear Seaside Hill. Now when it comes to the collecting missions, there are usually more than the required amount placed throughout the stage, so it allows us to pick and choose which Hermit Crabs we want to actually go for that will give us the best chance of beating this ringless. I really like how this shakes up the monotony of having to replay these stages for a fourth time. There's more in the way of theory crafting and routing the most effective route than ever before, something you will see as we progress. The annoying thing about the Hermit Crabs is that they have a habit of blending in with your surroundings. Whenever you think of crabs in the Sonic universe, the thing that will usually come to your mind are the Badniks in the classic games. However, these things appear as real Hermit Crabs, making them easy to blitz past if you aren't paying much attention. The first of the bunch can be located on this platform near the spawning point of the stage. It's really easy to miss as the platform is placed into the wall itself, so we have to jump off the stage to land down there collecting the crab. I only remember this specifically as this was the bloody crab I couldn't find for the life of me. Back when I was collecting all of the emblems in the game. The spring here will take us back to the normal pathway, collecting another crab for our trouble. It's best to take your time as these things can be hidden anywhere, including inside containers or stone walls. To their credit, the character's dialogue will indicate whenever we're nearby any crabs so you can use that as a means of pointing you in the right direction. As we reached the first checkpoint, we already had half of the Hermits collected, and our good luck only continued upon reaching the open beach, as the sixth was placed underneath yet another storm block. We almost ended up hitting a ring container here because I destroyed the wrong one, however Vector's hitbox didn't have enough reach to connect with it thankfully. Just in this section alone, we were able to uncover yet another two Hermit Crabs, one placed under the pillar that we need to use the cannons to reach with Charmy as the leader, and the other placed beneath a pushable stone slab, bringing our total to eight as we reach the what would be minecart section. I say would be because the minecart is pretty much absent here, which makes sense given our current objective is focused around exploration, and thanks to this we're able to access the marble foothold that we simply couldn't access with the other three teams. Mind you, there's nothing interesting here other than the ninth hermit crab, and once we enter the more open section of the circuit, placed upon a rogue island to the left, we collect hermit crab number 10, successfully clearing Seaside Hill. When you sit down and think about it, we haven't even cleared half the stage's layout, which just shows how quickly some of these missions can end if you're able to write the stages effectively. Despite appearing like another collecting mission, our task in Ocean Palace is actually a test of ourselves. There is a single trail place at the end of the stage, so all we are really partaking in is a traditional point A to B mission objective, and this is where the twist comes into play. You see, we can't engage the enemies, like at all. If we get close to them, they will activate, and our client will berate us for our mediocrity, essentially serving as a death. 
At a first glance, this mission seems like hell because of the actions of the AI, but this is where Espio comes into play. Being a highly skilled ninja and a chameleon to boot, despite having the worst tornado variation in the game, seriously the range is so abysmal I hate it so much. Upon activating his tornado, this will turn Espio invisible, and this grants him a number of properties. This includes approaching enemies without being detected, or phasing through lasers without taking damage. My absolute favourite feature of this ability though, is that it will actually deactivate the AI of the other members. As long as you remain invisible, Charmy and Vector will stay idle until you either take damage, which will subsequently blow your cover, or if you switch them yourself. Not only does this give us the ability to easily bypass the eggplants undetected, because the AI remains idle, they won't be able to cream themselves into the ring trails either, effectively giving us another alternative in the challenge rather than relying so heavily on the flight formation. Weirdly enough though, the traps in the stage itself don't care whether Espio is invisible or not, and so we were blindsided by the collapsing pillar killing us, which was bloody hilarious. We will have to still use the other formations, such as this platforming section as Espio isn't able to jump high enough, but as long as we quickly switch back to our stealth mode, we can just continue on reaching the first checkpoint. Now Vector is required for the number of doors that we have no other ways to break through, but aside from those instances, Espio is able to handle pretty much any obstacle that came our way, jumping down to the lower path in order to avoid the ring balloon placed in the centre of the adjacent walls. Sooner or later we hit a dead end, as the pathway that was once beyond this door has been blocked off, being replaced with a mechanical bud. As Charmy is a bee, he can pollinate the flowers through the use of the thunder shoot, and this will open a portal that will transport us to another part of the stage itself. It's basically a means of fast travel that allows you to traverse the otherwise linear stages freely, well, as long as a flower's nearby. This flower will take us to the next part of the stage, housing a linear corridor filled with the sleeping egg pawns, thus we once again switch back to Espio until Vector is needed to clear the fan ahead of us to reach the end of the stage, where we encounter the Chow, captured in the steel crate. These steel crates can be easily destroyed with our power character, so I wasn't really concerned about that. What I was wary of are the countless mechs that we aren't able to engage, due to the stipulation of the mission. Now you can attack the enemies so long as Espio is invisible, as they would just move around aimlessly since they can't actually see you. So with that knowledge in mind, I focused on taking out the flyer mechs before moving behind the cage. With our presence shrouded by the platform, we're able to switch freely back to Vector and destroy the cage undetected clearing the stage. If you haven't seen the previous part, I would highly recommend you do so, as we have already covered how this fight is possible to beat Ringless. Since it's identical here, I don't really think it's needed to go over it again. The only thing that was actually different this time around was that I couldn't beat the egg pawn on the first cycle, so the battle lasted a little bit longer, but nothing too significant, as we beat the egg hawk ringless with the chaotix. Oh, Grand Metropolis, what have they done to you? I'm not even going to sugarcoat this, guys. This level absolutely sucks with Team Chaotix. Now, whilst nothing in the stage differs too drastically than the other stories, what we'll be doing here certainly does. In order to clear the stage, we are tasked with destroying over 80 enemies, aka every single enemy in the stage, in order to proceed. Yes, you heard me right. We need to destroy every single enemy ringless and with only three lives. It's entirely possible to overlook an enemy and simply run by it, only to realise by the end of the stage I'll be forced to trek through the entire 6 minute layer all over again. And unlike the other teams that sat along the automated green building, Team Chaotix are thrown right onto the energy road itself, so we need to switch to the flight formation immediately, otherwise we're already collecting a ring. The strategy here was pretty simple, out of all the characters I was aiming to get Espio to level 3, simply because of the fact that the hominid attack of a fully maxed out speed character is enough to pretty much obliterate everything this stage has to offer in a single blow. And with Espio's ninja abilities thrown into the mix as well, you can see why it's really the best way to approach this mission in particular. This didn't really go to plan as you can only gain a level up for a specific character if you destroy an enemy with another as the leader. So as long as Espio remained as the leader, we would only gain level ups for either Charmy or Vector, which ended up happening as Espio reached through the first dozen of enemies, only switching to Vector in order to take out the green turtles. By the time we even reached the second checkpoint, our entire team had already met the second level, and with the free infinite ability, it was a simple matter of taking out the rest of the enemies to free the final level up from the cage. We even earned a team blast here which is pretty much useless this time around. As mentioned in the previous episode, the team blast was all functioning as basic screen nukes had their own exclusive properties that differentiate them depending on the team. For Team Sonic you just get limited access to the light speed attack, nothing crazy. For the other teams though they are actually rather insane. For example Team Dark's team blast will freeze time for a limited time, allowing you to destroy enemies whilst they're frozen or clear a stage with a faster time. Rose's team blast is by far the best out of the bunch as they gain both invincibility, a shield and a single level up for every character, making them overpowered as hell. And for Team Chaotix? Well, with every enemy destroyed by the Team Blast, they will actually gain a set amount of rings. And since rings also fill up the Team Gauge, if you use their Team Blast in, say, Robot Carnival, the accumulated rings will end up filling the gauge again, allowing us to abuse it. But there lies the issue, because of our 
that challenge stipulation, the best tool available to us last time is no longer usable. I did consider unmapping the Team Blast altogether to mitigate any risk of pressing it on instinct. It's just that Heroes doesn't have a Steam port or anything of the sort, so this sort of configuration is rather cumbersome to even change really. I did try getting rid of the Team Blast in an empty area, however this doesn't work either, since the Chaotix will still gain rings for every enemy defeated until the Team Blast gauge fully depletes. As we enter the building, make sure you wait for the egg pawn to fall in where the wooden crates are. There are two bannocks hiding behind the boxes and the one that drops down. The latter is extremely easy to miss like I did the first time since SBO was invisible at the time, and if I didn't end up dying which respawned us back at the previous checkpoint, we would have been forced to search the entire stage all over again just to find the damn thing. On the subject of dying, thankfully Sonic Team had the foresight to keep the collectibles or amount of enemies killed independent from the checkpoint, so even when you have to go back upon dying, it doesn't really matter since the enemies you killed beyond that point will remain in the dead state and won't respawn. Once we cleared out the linear corridors, we had over 60 enemies in our kill count, with another 3 added onto it using the cannons with Vector as the leader. It looks a little sketch as we have to shoot ourselves essentially over a bottomless pit, but we jump off the enemy and not through them so there's no real way to die here. Approaching the final section of the stage with the many grind rails, we can just take out the final few flying enemies with the thunder shoot, scaling the inside of the building and destroying the ways of enemies to finally complete this hell of a mission ringless. I just bloody hope that this is the worst of it. Compared to what we just had to go through in Grand Metropolis, Power Plant doesn't really seem all that bad. I mean all we have to do is track down the three golden turtles and defeat them. This means that we can avoid pretty much any other combat encounter entirely, but of course this is Power Plant, a stage with more hazards, more rings and frankly way more bullshit to contend with. Even when we found the mechs it's more convoluted than just defeating them, as they are locked in these cages where we need to find the switches beforehand. As a child I didn't even know that you could unlock these cages, as I've always used the team blast to nuke them off screen. It wasn't until this playthrough that I realised that there were actually switches for us to exploit. The only rings that we even need to worry about are the ring trials placed along the energy roads. Using Charmy's flight we're able to easily bypass them, clearing out the multiple ways of enemies to force the platforms up to the next section. The first golden turtle is caged up just before the first checkpoint, surrounded by four of the flying mechs. Naturally we take those out first, before locating the switch plays inside one of the steel crates. Flipping the thing on its back, Vector takes it out with a simple belly flop as we reach the first checkpoint. Believe it or not, we're literally right underneath the second turtle mech, as there is a pulley just above the shield container that will take us to the thing. Now the switch, for the lack of a better term, is in the form of these targets. One to the far left to be exact, and it's here where I quickly want to correct something I said in the previous episode. Final Fortress is actually possible to beat with Team Dark, and it's due to the discovery that the gooder you get from hitting the target is random. I found this out because I kept dying, as SBO's pitiful tornado attack got him killed, whenever I was trying to flip the turtle on its back. On some occasions the reward will be a Team Blast, yet on the others I would receive a ring container. So in that sense we would have just needed to keep dying with Team Dark until we received something other than a set amount of rings. But the second turtle defeated though we continued on, once again falling fits into the damn ring balloon placed over the rising energy path. Some things just never change do they? The final golden turtle is located in the linear corridor where Team Rose's version of the stage ends, and for a while this had me stuck. For the life of me I couldn't find the switch to open the cage and I didn't want to risk using the Team Blast either, just in case the rings were added to our ring count before the stage would end. It turns out that they placed the switch in this flying cage further on in the stage, requiring us to backtrack. The good news is Power Plant is possible to beat Ringless. In a similar vein to Team Rose, Chaotix also spawn on the side of the arena without the mandatory ring, making the first rival fight possible ringless. An interesting thing to note is that whenever SBO is invisible, the rival team will instead focus their attention on the idle AI, who won't fight back whatsoever. This led to an extremely easy and rather funny encounter with Team Dark, as I placed SBO on the steel crates leaving the other two where they initially spawned. Since the rivals do take into account your formation regardless, Team Dark led with Omega, who circled around the edge of the arena to engage Charmy and Vector. However, since Omega was holding the other two at the time, as soon as he reached our range, we was actually able to defeat Team Dark with only a single attack. If only all the rival encounters went this smoothly. Oh for fuck's sake! That didn't just happen okay, you saw nothing. Moving on from the calamity of Casino Park, Bingo Highway honestly surprised me with how forgiving it was, despite of what transpired the last time we were here. This time around, in order to gain access to Eggman's hideout, we have to collect 10 casino chips, and like the other collecting missions there are more than the required amount throughout the stage, and this helped us immensely when it came to avoiding the various pinball sections. 
The fist of the 10 chips are just straight up given to us at the spawning point, but we do have to be careful because of this ring balloon placed in the centre of the cluster of springs. To avoid it, we have to switch to Charmer and fly just high enough so we can hit a spring take on us over the collision of the balloon. The second ship was just beyond the wind fan, locked in a case that unlocks once all the enemies in the area are defeated. Even the mandatory pinball sections are easier in Team Chaotic's case, thanks to Espio's invisibility. Because we can disable the AI, we can avoid the biggest hurdle that was present in our previous run, the potential of our team members doing something that will end up fucking us over. From here we have two choices, we can either take the pinball route to collect the chips along the tables and no doubt hit many rings in the process, or Charmy can activate one of the mechanical flowers, transporting us further in the stage. I already know which one we're choosing today, and it seems we chose wisely as we're rewarded with another two casino chips raising our total to four. Just whatever you do, do not jump down to the lower pinball table. I did so under the assumption that there might have been another casino chip here, only to be forced to restart once we inevitably ran into some rings. Instead, just hit the checkpoint and activate the next flower so we can avoid another pinball segment. We will have to backtrack here as there is a casino chip located above a cluster of springs. And of course, we find our sixth chip just sitting peacefully in the centre of this ring loop. I was honestly hoping there would be enough chips just in the regular section so we can avoid the pinball tables completely, but this sadly isn't the case. And as soon as I used the tornado attack to deactivate the AI, Fexa fell off the flower and onto the table. Thankfully, he got himself stuck in one of the roulette wheels and couldn't get himself out, giving us enough time to get off the table and summon them back safely. With only four of the chips remaining, it's thankfully possible to find three of them without even getting back onto the pinball tables, as they are placed further on in the stage. We only had to return to the tables when searching for the final chip, which was a breeze for SPO as long as you avoid the bingo numbers along the track. There's even a green neon sign pointing down at the chip as well, so just just look out for that and it's entirely possible to beat Bingo Highway Ringless with Team Chaotix. Thank god. Robot Carnival, just like the other teams, is impossible because of that mandatory ring at the start. So we just have to use the flight formation or SBO's tornado attack to painstakingly take out each wave of enemies to clear the boss with a minimum of a single ring. I'd say it's even harder in Team Chaotix's case because we can't abuse the team blast like we could with the others but it's still nothing too taxing. Rail Canyon can be considered our first real stage of the run. By that I mean there's no gimmicks to contend with we don't have to collect anything or destroy a certain amount of enemies. Just a traditional get from point A to B mission structure, just as nature intended. You may think that our best solution here is to just deactivate the AI with SBO. That pretty much doesn't work unless they somehow fall off the rail. If we leave them be, they will just gradually move forward until they hit a ring. So our best bet is to once again use the flight formation and just switch to an adjacent rail to avoid the numerous trails. All of the egg pawn encounters here are also optional, so it's in our best interest to just avoid them, activating the switch to change the direction of the illumination rails to reach the next grinding section. The section where we had to bait the egg pawns away from the rings last time is suddenly blocked off by this massive gear, and with no springs in sight, it appears that we're stuck until you explore the hole in the wall that contains a flower and with that we can enter the cage. This part is actually way easier with Team Chaotix because of the lack of rings, so we can just easily dismantle the egg pawn, switching back to Espio to grind along the track solo. At some point it's best to revert to the flight formation just as a safety precaution. The last thing that we'd want to do is accidentally fling off the rail because of the jank. The three ring containers that were here previously are replaced with just one along the centre rail making it far less tense to avoid. From this point on, Rail Canyon transitions into a long grinding section, where all we need to do is slowly move forward and occasionally jump onto one of the adjacent rails. Nothing too interesting. I made the choice to jump down to a lower platform though so we can activate the checkpoint, and I'm glad we did. Because of a bout of impatience, we failed a huge skip that would have taken us all the way back if we didn't activate that checkpoint. The final segment of the stage revolves around a small little puzzle, where we have to grind around a loop and destroy the enemies so we can activate the rail switches trapped within the cages. It's a bit tricky because of the camera, and the fact there is the train also looping around the oval track. I couldn't figure this out for the life of me, so in the end after only activating a single switch, we just used a flight formation in an attempt to reach the red rails, and sure enough this worked. As mentioned in the previous part, you can also jump from a higher rail to land on the orange roof in the station as it does have collision, completing Rail Canyon without collecting any rings. Our objective in Bullet Station revolves around destroying 30 of these cannons littered about the stage. Now there are more than 30 throughout the entire level, but our success is dependent around one thing. Are you able to destroy 30 of these things before we reach the cannon set piece that will force us to collect at least a few rings? From my testing, sadly no. Now I admit I could be overlooking something, but I just wasn't able to destroy 30 cannons before reaching that set piece. The closest I ever got was around 22, which sadly isn't enough. The good news is that you're only forced into a few ring balloons as we 
can beat this stage after the first cannon set piece. Reaching the quarter during the minecart section. Overall though, it sadly isn't possible. Just like last time, Egg Albatross isn't possible to beat Ringless either because of that mandatory ring. But I just want to bring this battle up because I discovered something that I didn't actually know about before. The bottom carriage with the awkward hitbox has this cannon in the centre of it that will shoot spike balls towards you. All of this time, I assumed that it was just a part of the carriage itself. But no, if you use the thunder shoot, you can actually destroy the thing, which will make dealing with it completely trivial. With that though, we can beat the Egg Albatross with a minimum of a single ring. Frog Forest is definitely an interesting stage this time around, as our best friends last time around, the Green Frogs, are turned against us in the form of a stealth mission. Apparently the frogs here are the biggest snitches on the planet, and their rain will magically alert them next to your presence, so we have to avoid them. Now to be fair, they do alter the level design to compensate for this, since you can no longer use them to build up path ahead of you, which was rather awkward I have to be honest. Espio will be our greatest asset in this stage by far, as per usual, as we make use of his special ability to slip by the frogs undetected jumping down to the lower vine, which was slightly dodgy with a small room for error. We were able to land upon it though, so we were safe to switch back to the flight formation in order to skip the vine entirely avoiding the ring trail in the process. Speaking of vines, the segment where we would need to activate the frogs so we can flourish the mushroom springs kind of got us stuck. In this version of the stage, there is a swinging vine that we will need to use to propel us up to the checkpoint above. It's just that this damn thing pulled a cold hard crash, so I couldn't see it off screen. Because of this, I was severely confused, and thought we needed to grab the frog's attention which resulted in a death. The next time the thing actually bothered to show up on screen, so we're able to press on from here. The flower propeller is where this stage shall reach its end. As I mentioned last time, the placement of the skyward ring balloon differs between the stories. For Team Dark and Rose, the ring balloon is placed slightly off centre, so it's actually possible to avoid it with the rigid movement of the propeller. By that same token, Team Sonic and Chaotic share the same placement, and so we are forced to collect the fire rings no matter what we try. I thought maybe if we turn the SPO invisible, so only he grabs a hold, our hitbox might be slightly smaller, so we could theoretically slipped by, but no, that didn't work unfortunately. And of course, just like before, during the second propeller set piece it is actually possible to clear it ringless, beating Frog Forest with a total of 5 rings. Given how much I actually hate Lost Jungle, I really wasn't looking forward to having to go back through this level with a stipulation added on top, but to my surprise this was actually one of the easiest stages thus far to root. With our next collection mission all we have to do is trap down 10 Chow. As usual there are more than 10 Chow within this stage. Even better is that we can actually collect over half the the requirement literally in the first section of the stage itself. We start off on this vine, and you have the option of either jumping down to the lower platform, or switching to the flight formation to fly up to a higher vine. If you want to get out of this stage seamlessly, for the love of god choose a higher vine. There's a flower here that will take us to a platform that has two chow, immediately raising our total as soon as we free the second chow from their confinement. The third chow is trapped within the cage along with the spring that we need to use to reach the next platform. To unlock it, it's just a simple matter of taking out the standard egg hammer, so we're already not even passing the first real platform, we've already collected a third of our quarter. This momentum only continues as we find the next two chur along these floating platforms, reaching the first checkpoint with half the chur already saved. The frogs here are remorseful for the trouble they caused in the previous stage, so they will actually grow the fruit this time around so we can ascend further up the stage finding chair number 6 hidden in the cluster of wooden crates. Do you remember that tricky section with the three vines and the ring balloon? Well it's back, and this time it looks even harder. Instead of three vines there are only two, and their placement also seems further back than usual, so we can't just simply jump early like we did before. I honestly thought we were screwed here since it appears impossible to reach the other side without the automated push of the swing, but I somehow managed to do it on my first try. I don't know what happened here exactly, we just jumped off and held the flight button down rather than mashing it, and this gave us just enough distance to bridge the gap without touching the ring balloon. The seventh chair is located here in a steel cage, so we had to take out another egg hammer in order to free it from captivity. To the right of here, hidden behind a few bushes, the eighth chair is just floating freely on the lily pad. So far, this stage was going incredibly well. We managed to complete Lost Jungle Ringless after the automated loop, with a chair bouncing on the left of the path on top of the mushroom, and as long as we avoid the black frogs and the falling fruit, the final Cherry is placed on yet another floating platform before the flower propeller. I'm utterly shocked at just how easy this was. When it comes to the rival battles, Team Chaotix have it easy, in the sense that they spawn on the opposite side of the arena for both fights, making them the only team that it's possible to beat both of these rival battles ringless with. This time around it did take way longer to beat because Amy refused to get the hell out of the arena, but our approach is identical to the rest. Spam the tornado attack and just hope for the best. Hang Castle is back with yet another collectathon. Hidden throughout this haunted castle lies 10 keys and we're tasked with finding them all. Now believe it or not, but this is the only stage in the game that doesn't have more than the guffings than the game wants you to collect. 
There are 10 keys here and 10 keys only, so there's no real way to get out of here without traversing the entire length of the stage. We start off at the midpoint which is the same as Team Raw, so it's not the longest stage by any means. The first key is located underneath the wooden crates, where we need to activate the spherical switches in order to flip the stage on its head. So far so good. Grinding down the rails, we reach the spring that takes us to the circular pillars, taking out the guard bots before finding the second key, underneath this floating platform with the four torches. Where the mandatory light speed dash is for the other teams, instead we just find a flower that we can unlock via a switch, and this will take us back to the start of the stage, opening the door so we can enter the building. Placed on the platform, we can just grab the third key before fleeing from the angry egg pawns. Riding the floating platforms up to the grind rail, we actually want to grind up the rail this time around, jumping over a ring container. The reason why I did this was because I was curious as to why the platform didn't take us up to where it usually did, and thought surely there had to be something up there. This hunch was proven correct, as we were able to grab key number 4, leaping off the right side to hit the next checkpoint. Now the fifth key was yet again placed underneath a torch platform, it's here where I messed up. There is a flower besides this platform that you can't activate from the air, you have to land on the platform itself before Charmy can activate it. I didn't want to do this though because of the cluster rings on the base, so we just avoided it. I did this with the mindset that there were more than 10 keys placed throughout the stage itself, as every other collection mission in the game has always had more than the required amount. That isn't the case for Han Castle, which is just bizarre, because this is the only stage that has the exact amount of the McGuffins that are required to complete the stipulation. I didn't realise this until we already had 9 of the 10 keys, and the flower took us all the way back to the start of the stage, which sucked hard. Now you can land along the edge of the platform and Charmy will have the range to activate the flower portal without hitting the rings with his thunder shoot, with the final key being placed in the middle of the three egg pawns. What I didn't mention is that we were on our last life at this point, and so I really didn't want to engage these things whatsoever, but we were able to jump over them with the flight formation, completing Han Castle ringless. Now if you guys thought Grand Metropolis would be the worst stage we'd have to complete in this run, you've clearly not seen what Mystic Mansion has in store. In order to complete this mission we need to blow out the red candles, something you can only do with Espio's tornado attack. Vexa can't do it nor charm it, and to top it off we need to extinguish 75. Yeah, we have to blow out every single candle in this 15 minute stage. Now I'm not going to go through this entire stage like I usually would, as we'd be here all day. Instead I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of some of the problems I encountered throughout this nightmare, and how we problem solved our way through, since it is actually possible to beat, believe it or not. Our biggest obstacle wasn't necessarily anything the stage offered in the way of enemies or hazards. Simply the fact that some of these candles are placed right next to the trailer rings, in these linear corridors. You might be thinking that SBO can deal with this with his special ability, but not really. Because the camouflage is tied to the tornado attack, and we need to use it multiple times to extinguish candles, the moment SBO returns to normal, the stupid AI will relentlessly careen themselves into the ring trails on impulse. It's at this point where I wish the camouflage was marked with its own button, so we could stay in that state independently from the tornado, but that isn't the case sadly. So at first I thought this stage was impossible to clear, because of just how easy it is for the AI to hit the rings in these corridors, until we found a clever workaround. We still want to approach the torches first as a camouflaged Espio, in fact you always want to do this. However, once you've blown out the candle and Espio reveals himself, whilst Espio is still in the air throughout its tornado animation, you want to switch to the flight formation right away. This will not work if you wait for Espio to hit the ground. You need to switch immediately while he's still in the tornado animation. In Sonic Heroes, you can't switch formations mid-air. The change will only be made once you've landed on the ground. In this case though, because you'll switch to Charmy the moment Espio touches the ground, your team members will be forced into Espio immediately, this preventing them from actually careening themselves into the rings in these hollow corridors. Rinse and repeat this method throughout the entire stage, a Mystic Mansion is actually possible to beat ringless. You just have to take your time, you're going to be spending a good 10 minutes in this stage regardless, so if you try to rush, expect to make a ton of mistakes. So colour me surprise, I thought this was going to be absolutely impossible, I've gotta be honest. As expected if you've already watched the previous episode, Robot Carnival isn't possible to beat ringless because of the mandatory ring. I'm only bringing this up though because for Team Chaos it specifically, I guess it's slightly harder to beat the gauntlet with only a single ring. With the other three teams we could just make use of the team blast when it came to the tougher enemies such as the egg hammers. We can't do this with Team Chaotix for obvious reasons, so this will take slightly longer with you having to take them down the normal way. Still though it's nothing too different as we move on to the final zone of the game. With Egg Fleet we are put on yet another stealth mission, at least this time it actually makes sense. I guess the Ocean Palace mission mission also made sense with the Chow hostage, but then you had the frog forest stealth objection with the frogs are the greatest snitches on the planet, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Anyway, to top all of this off, Team Chaotix actually start later on in the stage as well, spawning along this grind rail, taking the mandatory rings at the very beginning of the stage off the table. Instead of remaining on the rail, it's actually easier to switch to the flight formation and jump to the right where the floating platforms are. Unlike last time, there aren't any rings here, so we can just descend down until we land 
land on the first battle fleet, we will have to go solo with Espio from here on out, as there's a switch in the midst of these enemies that will open the door. We don't have to engage the enemies here thankfully, so just leave them be and we can progress on. I'm not entirely sure what happened here as we needed Charming to reach the higher platform after a checkpoint. The enemy saw us. Surely it saw us, it's looking right at us. Yeah, it just moved away and we were able to continue. I'll be honest, this confused me into thinking that it wasn't actually a stealth mission after all, which went to bite us in the arse later. When the flight ring janked out and didn't take us over the wall to the rail, and because I thought maybe we couldn't just walk by the enemies, we were detected and had to start over. Even on the next attempt, the flight ring still didn't give us enough height. The only reason why we were able to land on the rail in the first place was because we glitched through the wall itself. This game is utterly jank, man. There was a ring balloon here interconnecting the two rails, so we just jumped over to the higher platform on the left and scaled the section that way instead. The next battleship is slightly harder than before. All we have to do is activate some more switches, three in total. This time, however, there are two locks in the steel crates, meaning we will have to destroy them with Vector without being detected by the numerous egg pawns. We got through this one on the first try, but you might be better off destroying the egg pawns here with Espio first just in case. Because it's the variant where you have to press all the switches simultaneously, I should have killed the enemies beforehand. Rather than doing so, since you can actually push the disabled AI by rubbing into them with SPO, we were able to position the other two onto the switches, allowing us to open the door with ease. A finicky solution, but hey, it's still a solution. Naturally, we left Charmy and Vector there until they were needed again to traverse the fans with the triangle dive, taking care to glide over the enemies whilst avoiding the ring balloons. The final battleship in the stage is by far the trickiest to figure out. There are around 9 switches here with some blocked off by the cages, and of course the lasers roaming across the ground. Needless to say, you will have to take out the egg pawns and cannons with Espio before even attempting this, only switching to Vector to destroy the crates unlocking the way forward. As we enter the final portion of the stage, we're met with two choices. There's a cage that we can unlock that houses a target for Vector to destroy, and this will activate a vault pole taking us up to the final room. On the other side, we can ignore this completely if we choose the flight path. In this case though, I decided to go out my way to unlock the cage. No matter which side you choose, there are lasers blocking the higher platform, so we can easily avoid these with Espio's camouflage. If we chose the flight route instead, we would have to squeeze in between the lasers and avoid the cannon aiming at you, so under our stipulation where we can't damage boost, the pole vaults just seem more feasible overall. To unlock the final door taking us to the goal, we have to contend with the E2000 mechs. Because of the sheer amount of cannons here, the mech couldn't be seen whatsoever until it was too late. Even then though, without the team blast, I wasn't even sure how to approach this thing. Surely they weren't expecting us to home an attack spam right? Right? Now this took a millennia, as the robot couldn't see SBO yet it can still react to your attacks, parrying you after a few hits. We just had to repeatedly deal a little bit of chip damage until it parried, wait until it stopped and then repeat the entire process until it finally went down. As you can imagine, it was incredibly time consuming and tedious. With that out of the way though, it is possible to finally beat Eggfleet Ringless. Final Fortress this time around is actually my favourite missing archetype in the chaotic story, as we're tasked with collecting a total of 5 keys to unlock the door where our mysterious client is located. Unlike Han Castle, there are a total of 6 keys within this version of the stage, so we do have some degree of control into which keys that we want to go for. With the first key sitting within the cage after the first grind rail, we make steady process taking out the shielded egg pawns with our power character. There's a flower just after this that will take us right to the end of the stage, and not going to lie, it's bewildering why this is even here. Now there is a final key collect to pull upon destroying the two armored egg hammers. It's just that if you try to go over there in the first place, the door will close on you before you can even get out of the room. All this flower serves as is a checkpoint rather than a means of grabbing another key early on. It doesn't really matter for us though as the second key is placed on the same platform as the flower, inside the debris that you'll need your power character to clear. Rather than using the triangle jump to scale across the adjacent walls, we took a gamble with Charmy and it paid off allowing us to free the third key from the cage. So far, this was going incredibly well for us. Unfortunately, our momentum ran headfirst into a brick wall upon reaching key number four. So there are two paths that you can take here. The lower path with the godly amount of cannons, or the upper rail that we need Charmy to reach. The fourth key is on the upper route, and to grab it from the cage, we have to take out three waves of air cameras, around four in total. Because we can't use the team blast, we have to do it the long way by knocking them off balance with the thunder shoot, exposing the head to deal damage with Vector. If you destroy the cannons here, there are a number of that you can grab to help you like a shield and the invincibility. We still ended up dying here though because Vector got too close as his spitter tap actually pushed him forward and we ended up colliding head first with the thing. As soon as you knock the egg hammer down, you want to snap with Vector from a distance. So even when he pushes himself forward, you'll still be a safe range away. We'll come back to this later though as we didn't grab this key until the end. Upon respawning, I couldn't get back to the upper path, so we had no choice but to move on grabbing the fourth key once we took out the golden E2000 mech. Because of the shield egg pawns getting in the way with the 
Lemon Pellets, I had to switch to Vector to get rid of them, which was nerve-wrecking, when a simple hit can ruin the run. Once they were gone though, we had to take out the Golden Eaterverse and the Tedious Wear Vespio, as we did back in Eggfleet. It's here where I intentionally died to spawn back before the fourth key. I knew already from the flower earlier in the stage that the final key was blocked off by two Egg Hammers. This doesn't sound too bad considering we have to take out four to grab this other key, but the platforms here have a lot more space in contrast to the tiny block of the final section. It's just way easier to take out four at range than two in a closed off area, where we are forced to engage. But with that, Final Fortress is possible to beat Ringless, wrapping up the last of the action stages. Coming into this one, I was honestly terrified. Since the Team Blast is now off the table, the Egg Emperor on paper just appears to be too much for someone to realistically handle. I myself am also guilty of thinking this too. Lo and behold though, the flight formation comes through with just how broken it is. The Egg Emperor is in fact possible to beat Ringless, and it's a hell of a lot easier than I expected it to be. Literally all we have to do is level up Charming enough through the various balloons and containers on the straightaways. He doesn't even need to be level 3 to cheese this thing either. Level 2 is more than enough to win this fight with ease. Upon reaching the wide arena, you need to get rid of the cannons immediately with Vector. This allows us to focus directly on Eggman himself, without the need to dodge endlessly. Now the Thundershoot can actually paralyse Eggman's shield, allowing us to attack his weak spot, and since we can fly over his crescent energy waves, all we actually have to do is spam both the A button to keep ourselves in the air, and the attack button. The level 2 Thundershoot is enough to absolutely melt the Egg Emperor's health bar, as crazy as that sounds, ending this fight extremely quickly. Concluding this challenge with the knowledge that no, you cannot beat Team Chaotic's story without collecting your rings. I'm not going to get too out of shape about this. Taking away the mandatory rings that we have no control over, only three stages aren't possible to clear ringless. So overall this was a far greater shoving compared to the previous episode. Coming out of this I am surprised as to just how much I enjoyed writing this one. I always believed that Team Chaotix would have been the worst story to try this challenge with and it's why I kind of put it off in the last episode. In the end it turned out to be the most enjoyable by a mile. It was cool to see both rival fights actually be impossible for once and the unique mission structure fundamentally changing our approach made for an engaging and dare I say fun experience? Rather than just reacting to the obstacles in the stage, we actually had to pay attention and theorycraft our ruse. It made it so I felt like I had way more control over the success of the run, more so than any of our previous challenges, and that's something I can appreciate despite the result. With all four of the main stories down, it's time to finally wrap up the Hero series. So join us next week when we take on the final story to see where it's possible to complete it without collecting any rings. Once next week's video wraps up, I will be announcing the next series, a series that you guys have been requesting, and I think you'll be surprised by what we'll be doing with that one, so please look forward to it. As always, I just want to take a moment to thank every single one of you who continues to support the channel. I know I say this every time, because it's true. This channel wouldn't be a thing without your guys' support, and all the love you bring to every video, so sincerely, thank you. With that though, I've taken up enough of your time, so take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye bye for now.